Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we're going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. So if you'd like to turn to that in your Bibles, it will be on the screen behind me too. Slightly different version, but it will be there nonetheless. So that's Matthew 21, and we're reading from verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So this morning is Palm Sunday, and we join millions of Christians around the world in celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And as a vicar's son, as a young kid, for me, my memory of Palm Sunday was very much the Palm Sunday procession. That's what we would do on Palm Sunday. Uh, The whole church would file out of the back doors, and we'd walk around the whole church holding our palm crosses and singing, All Glory, Lord and Honour. And it was, a, it was a great cacophony of sound and that sense of all singing outside, walking around, remembering this procession of Jesus into Jerusalem. And, you know, as a young kid, the, the big highlight for me on Palm Sunday was the way that when we filed back into the church, everyone was out of tune. <laughs> and, and you'd hear this whole cacophony of sound as people were trying to adjust their tones back to the right tone that the organ was playing and, and it, was, it was just a great sense of celebration and, and joy and of course the bigger uh, celebration for us kids as Palm Sunday was it was only a week away till the Easter egg hunt so Palm Sunday was a, was a day of celebration from my memory but also mixed with a bit of trepidation it had this kind of paradox about it we see this Great celebration, but also aware that we were coming up to the Last Supper and remembering Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday at the hands of the Roman soldiers. And then, of course, his resurrection on Easter Sunday. So though it was always a day of celebration, equally it's a day of sense of preparation for what is to come. And this triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we've just read about is recorded in all four of the Gospels. So it's very important. It's, uh, it's really, uh, it signifies the, the, the end of the journey of Jesus' ministry uh, and, the, and the beginning of his uh, completing his task that he came here to earth to accomplish. So it's recorded in all of the Gospels and it's an important day. Jesus spent the last three years preaching, teaching, setting the captives free, many miracles, raising Lazarus from the dead, turned water into wine, seen the lepers completely cleansed, seen the blind man's given their sight back, the deaf can hear, the mute can speak. Um, he's, he's at the pinnacle of his ministry, he's walked on water, and people have heard about this amazing miracle, and then he's fed 4,000 people. And then after that, he fed 5,000 people. So Jesus has a huge following in the region at this time. He's the talk of the town. And really, right at the height of his ministry, right at the height when everything is going so well and the disciples would have been, this is incredible, this is amazing that we're so close to this man. Matthew records that Jesus said to his disciples, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And Matthew observes that the disciples were filled with grief. So it would have been with some trepidation and sadness that the disciples accompanied Jesus on this journey into Jerusalem, for they knew what was awaiting him. It's the Jewish festival of Passover. At this time, the usual... um, 
people in Jer- it was about 35,000 people um, in Jerusalem at this time. It would swell hugely as all of the Jews would come into Jerusalem to celebrate the wonderful deliverance that God gave them against the Egyptians and Pharaoh. And they'd be celebrating the, the miraculous deliverance and they would eat lamb and they would eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And, and they, were, they were called to celebrate this and to pray for God's continued deliverance. And the Passover, of course, they were, they were under the, the harsh regime of the Egyptians and Pharaoh. And now the Israelites are under the harsh regime of the Roman Empire. Harsh taxes. The Romans didn't treat the Jewish with much respect. Anyone that would try to rebel or even have a, an inkling of a rebellion and lead a rebellion against Caesar and the ruling Roman Empire would be treated most horrifically. Crucifixion was as much an example to put fear into the, the minds of the Israelites as it was to punish and kill people. So we have here the Israelites living under a harsh Roman Empire, an oppressive regime. And Pontius Pilate was the governor at the time. He was a Roman governor, and his job was to keep the tax money coming in for the Roman Empire. His job was to quell any rebellion and to just keep the peace in what was, at this time of year, the Passover, a, 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 a tinderbox, because they were remembering God's deliverance and some re- rebellions would, would, would just spurt up out of nowhere. And, 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 and Pilate, who had brought thousands of Roman soldiers into the region, would quash them. Every spring he'd go to Jerusalem for the Passover to keep the peace. So of all the times to ride into any town or any city, Jesus choosing to ride into Jerusalem at the time of the Passover would surely get attention as he allows the crowds to worship him. Hail, Jesus of Nazareth. Hail, King. Hail the King. He is being worshipped. They are laying down their palm branches and their cloaks. And he says, if they don't worship me, even the stones will. But you know, there's something very different about this man coming into Jerusalem. This is no rebellion. This is no carefully fought out coup with a gang of people shouting against the Roman Empire. He's riding on a donkey, gentle, with humility. And there are shouts of joy and praise. There aren't the usual shouts against the Roman Empire and Caesar. There are shouts of joy and praise and celebration. It is a joyful time. This is a different king. This is a different triumphal entry. And the the royal muse at Buckingham Palace has about a hundred coaches that are still used today in royal processions. And the oldest coach there, and you can see them, is the Gold State Coach, designed by George III in the 1800s. It's been used uh, since 1821 in every single coronation. And the Gold State Coach is an amazing sight. It's three and a half metres wide. It's seven metres long. It's got golden cherubs carved out of it, gilt gold. It weighs four tonnes. It takes eight horses to drag it along. And inside it's laden with velvet and silk from Morocco. It's truly an impressive sight. This is how the kings and queens of this nation travel. The Sultan of Brunei owns the most opulent, expensive aeroplane in the world. $120 million dollars he spent on having it kitted out with solid gold wash hand basins. A solid gold whirlpool bath. Some say it found it difficult to even take off when they first tried to fly it. That's how kings and queens and, uh, of, of earthly empires arrive. With great pomp and great ceremony and great arrival. But this Jesus rides on a donkey, not a horse, not a stallion, not a mare, not an animal of warfare, not even on a male donkey, but he chooses a female nursing mother donkey with its little colt trotting along beside it to enter into Jerusalem. And he is hailed king. So where is this man's kingdom? Where is his kingdom? Who is he king of? 
Well, Jesus in John's Gospel, when asked about his kingdom, said, my kingdom is not of this world. And when we look at all his teaching, he spoke again and again about his kingdom. Many parables, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who bought a field. The kingdom of heaven is like somebody who planted seeds, a farmer who planted seeds. The kingdom of heaven is like, is like, he told many parables about the kingdom of heaven. He spoke about this kingdom that he was from and that he was Lord of. In the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. Clearly, this kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. And when we read the parable of the sower, Jesus is talking about the hearts of men and women. The seed fell on good soil and on thorny ground. And then the, 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 the thorns grew up around it. But he's talking about the hearts of men and women. The kingdom of God, nor will they say, see, here it is, or there it is. We can't see it. The kingdom of God is within you, Jesus says. This king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is king of the kingdom of heaven, which is within us, in our hearts. Jesus comes to establish his rule and his reign and his lordship in the hearts of men and women, of you and of me. And I know that when we hear about Jesus reigning in our hearts, I mean, I I certainly kind of thought, well, this is our our heart, our, our physical heart. The, the, the heart, the kind of, you know, you just dissect a heart in biology at, at school and see the ventricles and the atria and, you know, that, that's, we have this heart and we hear this word about our, our heart, the organ that pumps blood around our body, but that is just a physical organ. So it's an amazing physical organ, but it is just a physical organ. It has no influence whatsoever on your thoughts, your feelings, your attitudes, your character, your personality, your decisions. It's just a human organ. Seen on the news um, this week in Cambridgeshire that doctors managed phenomenally to make the first ever non-beating heart transplant. Normally, hearts are transplanted. Sorry if anyone's squeamish here. Normally, hearts are transplanted uh, when they're still beating. But this was the first non-beating heart transplant. And the, the guy that's, that was the recipient, 60-year-old man, he, he just said, it's amazing, I can, I can now walk again. I've got this new lease of life. Thank you, the NHS. Thank you so much for the donor and the donor's family. And it's wonderful. But what he didn't say is that my decision-making has gone out the window. And I've suddenly got this new passion for fast cars that I never had before. And I've really changed as a person. Because it's just a physical organ that he received. Dr. Joseph Stowell, he's president of the Moody Bible Institute and worked at the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. And there's a movement that has invited millions of people around the world to give their hearts to Jesus and invite Jesus into their hearts. And Dr. Stoll defines the heart as this, the center of a person, the part of our being where we desire, where we deliberate and decide, the term for a person as a whole, his or her feelings, desires, passions, thoughts, understanding and will. That's our heart, our desires, our feelings, our passions, our thoughts, understanding and will. The Bible has a lot to say about the natural inclination of this human heart. Right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 6 verse 5 we read, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And Jesus said of the heart in Mark 7, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And a good man brings Good things out of the good stored up in his heart. But an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the heart the mouth speaks. We only need to read the news headlines to recognize that there is something fundamentally wrong with the human heart. 
In fact, if we're honest, we only need to look at ourselves and hear ourselves and think of ourselves to realize that there is something fundamentally wrong with the human heart. It's fair to say that at the heart of the human problem is the human heart. It's just broken. And the human heart can be really like the city of Jerusalem. There are many wonderful things about the city of Jerusalem. Amazing architecture and good things happened in that city. But at the same time, there were some awful things going on in the city of Jerusalem. There was greed. There was religious pride. There was sexual immorality. There was horrific violence. And our hearts can be like that city of Jerusalem that Jesus rode into. And just as he rode into the city to be Lord, so he wants to ride into the Jerusalem of our hearts and take his rightful place as Lord in our hearts. And we need that. If we're left up to our own heart devices, our own passions, our own feelings, our own thoughts, our own desires, though some of them are good, if we let that all run and reign, we get into all sorts of trouble. We need his lordship. We need his reign in our hearts. In Revelation 3, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. If a man listens to my voice and will open up the door, I shall come in. We need him to come in to our hearts. Jesus came to Jerusalem to solve humanity's problem. To deal once and for all for the sin of all mankind. To deal once and for all for the corruption in man's heart. To take that with him on the cross and take the full judgment of that onto himself. So that we could truly live with freedom without the corruption of evil hearts, but with freedom and joy and peace, and to receive his kingdom within us. And when we invite Jesus into the Jerusalem of our hearts, when we let him in, we see change. We see change. Just just look back down the road in Jerusalem here, and you see change. There's, There's palm branches strewn all over the road. There's palm trees with broken branches off them. There's a a man walking a donkey back to its owner. The dust is still settling and you can hear the crowds cheering. Something has changed here in this place because Jesus has entered. And so too in our lives, when we invite him to be Lord, we change because our thoughts and our feelings and our passions and our desires and our will begins to change. And I know it's the case for a lot here. It was certainly the case for me when I was at university and I, I gave my life to Jesus and, and, and wanted and, and said, Lord, come into my life. I want to follow you. I changed and my friends saw that I changed. I, I just no longer did the things that I used to do. I no longer bragged and boasted about the things I used to brag and boast about. No longer joked about the things that were no longer acceptable. My heart, my feeling, my thoughts, they changed. Not because I was trying to be different but because Jesus had come to rule and to reign and start to influence feelings and thoughts and attitudes. And we see that change in our lives, and it's a very real change. For God, who said, let shine, light shine out of our darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. Where our hearts were once dark, his light shines in, and it changes us. And you know, it's easy to beat ourselves up when we don't see the change as quickly as we think we should see it. It's easy to um, kind of put ourselves down, really. I thought you were sp- supposed to be a, a good person, a Christian, and yet you're still getting angry at this. Or you're still tempted by that. Or you're still saying those things that you shouldn't be saying. Or, or there's still stuff in your life that you, need, you know you need to sort out. And we can get quite, actually quite harsh with ourselves. But we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. I remember once seeing a, a, a kind of a slogan, a Christian slogan. You might have seen this yourself. It's like, be patient with me. I might make mistakes. God hasn't finished with me yet. You hear that? And I get the sentiment behind that. It's, 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 it's a good statement. The problem is, I saw it, it was in a barber shop. It was on the mirror in the barber shop. <laughs> I might make mistakes, God hasn't finished with me yet. It wasn't the best, it wasn't the best place to put it. But, but nonetheless, the, 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 the heart behind that was that we are, we are being transformed. We are on a journey from one degree of glory to another. Of course, that's not an excuse 
to say, well, Lord, I'll just live my life the way I want to because I'm being changed and, you know, it'll gradually, gradually I'll give that up. But at the same time, we must realize that God's transformation is inside out. It's not outside in. The Old Testament was all about outside in transformation. It was all about following rules and regulations and getting it right and doing the right thing. Hundreds of rules about keeping the Sabbath and, 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 and what you could and couldn't eat and what you could and couldn't do and the festivals you had to keep. It was God's answer to, for, from the outside in to deal with this corruption of the heart. But it never fully solved the problem. Christ came to fulfill the law. He rides into Jerusalem to represent and fulfill the new covenant of inside-out transformation. Inside-out transformation. That by his grace we can receive his righteousness. And no longer are we righteous through any acts that we do. But we are righteous by his grace. And then as a result of that we act righteously. The law made us righteous through what we do. But God's grace gives us his righteousness and then we act out of his righteousness. But we mustn't just invite Jesus down the main street of our heart, down the M40, down the motorway. Because, you know, there's B roads, there's A roads, there's even some single track roads. And it's very easy for us to say, Lord, come into my heart. I give my life to you. But there's these other little roads that I don't really want you to go down. So I'm going to put up a a no entry sign. And some of them are cul-de-sacs as well. I've always been quite an angry person because we were brought up. This isn't me personally, but just (laughs) might be me. But we were brought up in a family where there was always arguing at the dinner table. So that's how it's going to be. I can't really change that. Or temptation has always been a challenge and I just, Lord, I don't really want you in that area of my life. In the area of of, of giving, for example, giving of my time, my money, my resources, that's that's an A road that I'm just going to put up a no entry. Lord, come into my heart, but just this part of my heart, can we just leave that aside? Can we just, you know, could you just not ride down that part of my heart, please? Of course, God wants all of our hearts. He wants his reign and his rule in all of our hearts. Lord, you know I struggle with this. Lord, please help me with this. Lord, help me begin on this journey. Help me to change in this area with your grace. And when we pray like that, when we come to him like that, we can be encouraged by Hebrews 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He knows we have weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let's then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, I need your mercy. I need your grace. Come into all of my heart. Come into the areas where I've blocked you out so that you may be truly Lord and truly reign and your kingdom will truly come into my life. The palm branch is a sign of victory. The um, Olympic athletes uh, in Roman times would be given a crown of palm branches. Um, Palms were always signified as victory. In fact, on that great royal coach we talked about, one of the ornate decorations is of palm trees and palm branches. And of course, when the crowds lay down their palm branches, they are doing that not to make the road nice and smooth or to just cover the dirt. They're doing it as a symbol of victory because they're declaring that this man, this king, is victorious. And Jesus had shown so many victories up until now. They had witnessed this victory over sickness, victory over demons and the works of the devil, shown victory over nature through calming the storm. He, this was truly a victorious king coming into Jerusalem. And they believed that he was going to give them victory over the Roman Empire. That's why they're cheering. The same crowd are cheering for his crucifixion a week later. But they're cheering now because they believe he's going to be the one to set them free from the, the ravages of the Roman Empire. So there's this great sense of victory. It's a wonderful celebration. Victorious. And we see, we see victory uh, all the time on our TV screens. If you watch sport, we see victory a lot. Um, 
Australia and New Zealand in the Cricket World Cup, Malaysian Grand Prix. In two weeks' time, the Oxford-Cambridge boat race, and they'll be rowing for victory, men and women for the first time, rowing for victory. And, you know, there's, it, we, we, when we watch telly and when we watch an FA Cup final, it might be your team that you're supporting. And, and um, they, they, they score a the final goal, they won, and it's fantastic, and there's a great celebration and great victory. The cameras go right down onto the pitch and you're watching the, the team celebrate. They bring their family over and they go up onto the podium. They've got their winner's medals and the fireworks go off. They lift the cup and it's a wonderful sense of victory. And you can always sense the energy coming from the team as they celebrate the win. But I don't know about you, but when that happens as a, as a, as a fan or if it's my team or what have you, though it's great and I'm really happy for them, I somehow think they're enjoying it a bit more than I am. They seem to be really, really enjoying it. And that's probably because they're the ones that have put all the effort in. They're the ones that have trained. They're the ones that have gone through the pain and the, the stress and the, and the many stages to get to that place to win. And they're really, really celebrating. My effort has been, yes, I went to the kitchen, I got a beer out of the fridge, I sat down and I watched the game. And then some people might have uh, cheered and shouted at the ref as well. That is the sum total of the effort you've put into that victory. And you wore the shirt. But you don't really, uh, you're, you're joyful, don't get me wrong, and you're happy because you've, you, you've been vindicated for all those years of support, but you don't really enter into that victory in a way that the people that have won it enter into it. The victory that Jesus has won on the cross, he shares with us completely. We enter right into that victory, we have his victory. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over, over the cross. He triumphed over the works of the enemy. He triumphed over sickness. He triumphed over the lies of Satan. He triumphed over demons. He triumphed over all the things that come against humanity. He took all of man's sin to the cross and he won the victory. He triumphed over death. He defeated all the things that would defeat us. And he shares that victory right with us because we have been crucified with Christ. Our old nature has been taken to the cross with Christ. And he has crucified it onto the cross with him. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus because he shares that victory with us. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ Jesus. But I know that sometimes that's not really our experience. We believe it and we read it and we hear it. But when we look at our lives, we, we don't always grasp hold of all of that. We can feel that we're still struggling and still fighting things and still areas where we don't feel we have the victory. In areas of healing, in areas of, 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 of our own lives and, and things that might be going on in our lives. Where we think, where's the victory in this, Lord? I'm, I'm holding on to your promise. I'm holding on to what your word says. But where is the victory in this? Well, one word we can always stand on in those situations is that your present sufferings are nothing compared with the glory that is to be revealed. That is a promise we can always stand on, that our present sufferings are nothing compared with the glory that we will one day completely receive. I don't know about for you, but for me, the eclipse was a bit of a disappointment. <laughs> so, you know, it was really built up, rightly so, because it's an exciting, it's a historical event. It's not going to happen for many years to come in our region. So, yeah, I get that. And I saw all the footage on TV just building us up to it. And, and I'll be honest with you, maybe somewhat naively, because I hadn't fully researched it, I was expecting at the time of the eclipse for the birds to all go and float, flying back to their nests. I was expecting to see hedgehogs and badgers in the garden. I was expecting to see the whole of Mother Nature confused as darkness descended on High Wycombe at 10 at 9 o'clock. Uh, I was going to a meeting at work uh, at the time, managed to see a glimpse of it um, and saw all the footage of the wonderful people in the southwest seeing the whole thing. Managed to see a glimpse of it through the clouds, went into this meeting, was sat in the meeting, looked out the window at the point of complete eclipse and it was slightly darker. And it was probably slightly colder outside. No birds, no owls, nothing of that nature, no nightlife. And, um, and then wonderfully, half an hour later, the sun came out. <laughs> 
So it was a bit of a it was a bit of a disappointment. But I think probably what I forgot to to, to really know or, or, or recognise is that actually, in our area, it was an eighty five percent eclipse. Now in the Faroe Islands, it was a hundred percent eclipse, and the footage there was incredible. It went completely dark. All lights went out. And it was amazing. But, of course, um, for us, 15% of the sun was still shining through. And that 15% made a big difference. It was still light. And maybe some others in, in the southwest saw more of it. But for us, it, and, you know, sometimes our lives can be a bit like that. We believe in, in God's victory. We believe in the cross. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in all of the wonderful things Christ won for us on the cross. But there seems to be this, this partiality, this 15%. And, and something's still shining through. There's, I, still, I still have this, you know, this propensity to gossip, or I still have this, 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 these desires that are warring within me. Or I still have this, this kind of this anger, or these, these things that are going on, or these areas of my life that aren't sorted, and yet, where's the victory? And we can feel we've got this partiality in our lives. You know, one day the total eclipse of God's glory will wipe away every tear from every eye. Every knee will bow. And for eternity, we will celebrate the total eclipse of everything bad, everything wrong in the human heart. But until then, we thank him for his victory. Until then, we recognize the victory. And sometimes we've got to look back and see, goodness me, God has given me victories. And we, we don't know, I don't think we know the half of it of what he's kept us from, of, of how he sustained us, of how he's looked after us of how we've been able to avoid situations that we might never have known might have ended up in a certain way because of his grace and his work in our lives. We must always thank God for this victory. Because Jesus is riding into Jerusalem as triumphant king, as the one who triumphs over all. And we share in that victory. And we are to thank him for his victory and keep pressing in for the reality of his victory in our lives. And keep standing firm on the promises that he is victorious and that we are victorious with him and in him. Just to finish, in the summer of 2012, you may recall that the whole country, the whole Commonwealth in fact, celebrated the 60th jubilee of the Queen's coronation. And there were RAF flypaths, there were fireworks, there were concerts, there was all sorts of wonderful things going on just to celebrate this time. And the Queen, who is obviously Queen of the Commonwealth, and she travelled in that Golden State coach with great opulence in 1952. But she gives, at the end of every year, a speech at Christmas. And at the end of her Jubilee year, she chose to conclude her speech in this way. And she could have said, and she did say, thank you so much for the Commonwealth for celebrating my 60 years on the throne. And she could have actually ended in any way, but the Queen chose to end with these words. This is a time of year when we remember that God sent his only son to serve, not to be served. He restored love and service to the centre of our lives in the person of Jesus Christ. The carol in the bleak midwinter, ends by asking a question of all of us. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. The carol gives the answer. Yet what can I give him? Give my heart. Give my heart. We've sung about that this morning. We are called to give all of our hearts to him. And as we do that, as we allow this king who rode into Jerusalem, as king and lord, to come into our hearts and be king and lord of our hearts, as we allow him to go down all of the pathways in our hearts, as we invite him in again afresh this morning, and as we celebrate his victory, we can look ahead for this week with, with great joy, with great peace, knowing that the Lord of our hearts is the Lord who will take us all the way to eternity and will celebrate with him forever. Amen. Amen.